Welcome to a special COVID-19 pandemic episode of The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman, and today I'm pleased to introduce Professor Michael O'Sullivan, a senior lecturer in engineering science at the University of Auckland, and I might add, an alum of Stanford University. Uh, these are all uh, special COVID episodes, as you can see or hear, taped from our homes, uh, not always with the best audio uh, visual, um, but we, we thank you for your patience as we try to deliver some content to, the, to you that we think we'll you'll find interesting. So, Michael, I want to thank you and welcome you to the show. Thanks for coming today. All right. Thanks, Russ. Appreciate the invite. Now, you're an expert in operations research. Uh, and so can you tell us a little bit about what is the field of operations research and how do you normally spend your time both for teaching and research? Sure. So operations research these days is quite often synonymous with analytics. Um, but it's a best to best description for me is it's the science of decision making. Um, so we will build lots of mathematical models of various systems, health systems, for instance, um, and that will then will have algorithms that will help make decisions for those systems. So I think there's been a really interesting renaissance in operations research recently with everyone captures their data and then with analytics now they're starting to look at their data and with operations research now they can start making good decisions with their data. Um, yeah, so I, I, I had the privilege of reviewing your CV a little bit and I noticed that you've published widely on cloud computing, on using simulations to figure out staffing levels, construction sites, but tell me how did your your attention turn to COVID? Um, so a center of research excellence that I'm involved with here in New Zealand called Te Punaha Matatini, um, which is a group of a lot of researchers from all kinds of different fields, uh, was involved in New Zealand's response to COVID-19. So there are a bunch of people, Alex James, Mike Plank, Sean Hendy, Nick Stein, and Michelle Binney, uh, notably did a lot of the initial modeling for COVID-19 to help inform government response where uh, I came in along with my colleagues, Cameron Walker and Ilsa Zedens, was to start looking at what would the infection mean to ICU in particular, but also to wards and hospitals. So what was the effect gonna be on our health system? Yes. And we've been doing quite a lot of health system modeling. And so it was about, now we know a little bit about the modeling of the spread. What is it gonna mean for our health, health system in terms of um, how much volume they were gonna face due to COVID-19? Now, uh, was, was this something that you volunteered for uh, spontaneously or did they approach you and say, we need your expertise? How did it, how did it kind of go down? Yeah, so, so because of, um, so I'm just gonna use Tipuna Matetini shortcut, which is TPM. So uh, because, um, so Sean Hendy is the outgoing director of TPM and he knew what we did because we're part of TPM. And, and so he said, hey, we're busy doing uh, modeling how this infection will spread throughout New Zealand. Um, there's a lot of concern because overseas, with a lot of infection, there's a lot of people turning out to ICUs and they're being overwhelmed. And, you know, that's obviously led to a lot of problems elsewhere. Um, do you want to be involved in the modelling of that and trying to figure out what are we likely to see coming through both our hospital wards and our ICUs um, and help hospitals get ready for it? And, and what will the effect be of, you know, the lockdown and all these sorts of things? So it was really about, you know, we, we kind of got shoulder tap, but we were really happy to do it. Right, and, and, and we've noticed this all throughout academia that people are repurposing their research in many, in many ways to try to be helpful during the pandemic. So um, you've, you've kind of alluded to it, but were there a kind of a punch list of the high priority questions that you were trying to answer? And then tell us a little bit about how you approached it uh, uh, in terms yeah, of the sure. modeling decisions. Yeah, yeah. So um, there, there, there was sort of a, a list of things that wanted answered and it changed very quickly, I have to say. So it was really, and, I, and I'm sure lots of people uh, throughout the world will have the same feeling. It's definitely been a moving target. So actually, initially, where we got involved was um, in having a look at how uh, general practices should deal with potential COVID infections. And so we've got some modelling of um, a reasonably large general practice um, in the north of New Zealand, which has about 12 GPs operating out operating out of it, and I was having a look at what would the effect of seeing people in their car be on, for instance, because they may have COVID symptoms, have on how many people they could see per day. Um, that really quickly changed to, well, we're going to lockdown, um, and we know that the, you know, the epidemic is spreading, so how many people were expecting to show up at wards, how many people were expecting to show up in the ICUs, are we really going to be in trouble? Um, 
And so we we picked up a, so the initial model that um, our TPM colleagues had built was based on differential equations. Um, so a, a sort of a classical SEIR model. Uh, we picked that up and we added some extra steps into it for moving people into the ICU and it's into wards first and then to ICU. Um, and then we started adding some stochasticity around it. So um, my PhD in Stanford then came in, uh, which is really nice because I haven't, haven't looked at that stuff for a little while, actually. So doing continuous time Markov chain models, which allows um, you to model the uncertainty of people moving between different stages of the disease and whether they are at home or in the ward or, or in the ICU and so on. And so we started, we did that first at a countrywide level. And what I've been working on more recently is breaking it down into geographical areas because then, you know, the geography of our country and, and our roading system and transport system and so on then comes yes. into effect in terms yes. of... Yes, and, and I definitely want to get to that. I definitely want to get to that. But before that, yeah. maybe we should step back. Tell us sure. how the pandemic has gone in New Zealand. So New Zealand, as far as I can remember, is pretty much an island or a set of islands. Yep. And... Uh, uh, I don't even, and forgive me, but I don't know the degree to which they locked down entry and exit from the comp country. What were the sources of infection? What can you tell us about how the kind of natural history in the New Zealand, uh, how, how did it go? Yeah, sure. Um, I can tell you, tell you what I know, which um, I, I assume is reasonably accurate. Um, so most of, the, most of the infections in New Zealand came from people returning from overseas or visiting from overseas. Um, initially, there wasn't very much spread in the community, although there was some later on. Um, New Zealand locked down reasonably quickly. Actually, my daughter, who is about to enter her sophomore year um, at Stanford. Oh, that's um, wonderful. I didn't know yeah, that. So, yeah, yeah. So, she's, um, so she actually was in Japan at the time and came back to New Zealand um, and just made, I think she made it just after oh, we closed goodness. the borders um, and uh, she had to go into isolation for a couple of weeks. Um, so, yeah, we closed the borders relatively quickly, about the same time that we went into lockdown. We were in lockdown for, uh, I think it was four four weeks and maybe a little bit at level, what's, what's described here as level four lockdown, which is essentially, I think, what is called elsewhere shelter in place. Yes. Um, at that time, I mean, pretty quickly, the number of infections really, you know, turned around. So we went from, a, I'm not, not sure if you're familiar with the R0. I think Everyone's the R0, familiar. I am familiar, but I think it would be yeah. great for everybody if, if you could just describe this number, because it's a, almost a magical parameter in the pandemic. Yeah, so, so my understanding of R0 is that um, it's the number of people that you will uh, likely infect during your infectious period of the disease. So if an R0 of 3.5 means that I, if, you know, I could infect 3.5 people before I'm no longer infectious. So anything above one means it starts exploding exponentially. Um, and the R0 in New Zealand moved from an estimate, estimate of, well, there are a few different estimates, but all but like 2.5 or 1.8 before lockdown to a couple of weeks into lockdown is down to I think 0 0.49. So New Zealand turned it around really quickly. Um, I think we're now down to either one or zero active cases in the country. Wow. Um, and, we're down, and we're down to level, level two. So now we're allowed to move around. Um, we can congregate in groups of up to 100. So, for instance, I did my first um, soccer football training last night. For um, I run two teams of girls. Of about, so I had 26 uh, 11 year old girls running around for the first time for a while. And so um, there was a lot of excitement. It was good. Um, so yeah, so we moved from level level four um, and then to a couple of weeks at level three and now we're in level two and, and we may well go to level one soon. So New Zealand managed to turn it around really, really quickly. And I think um, I've sort of said in maybe the articles that you've seen, I think a lot of that has to do with um, a really good relationship between government and scientists. Um, and I think also they talk about New Zealand being the team of 5 million, not just when we support our rugby teams, but also I think in, in our response to the pandemic was, was pretty awesome. Actually, it made me quite proud of, of our country. Now, this is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Michael O'Sullivan, uh, who's in New Zealand and who's been part of the modeling effort. And th thank you. That was a great, in fact, I think, it's, I think we should spend a little bit more time on it because you are ahead of us in undoing the shelter in place. So can you actually tell us a little bit about what these levels were? So you said four was a lot like our shelter in place, which is still in, in, in enforced in much of the U.S. Uh, what was level three and two and, and where are you now again? Yeah, so we're, we're in level two now, um, but the restrictions in level two have changed a little bit. So 
uh, level four, essentially people were staying at home. Um, there was sort of one person who was a designated shopper who could go out and pick up things from supermarkets. Um, only essential services were operating. So uh, a lot of that is food and obviously health services. Um, but effectively we were, so myself and my wife and our four kids stayed inside and, and my wife um, went out and, and picked up the shopping from time to time. Uh, we were quite careful, actually. So when she put the shopping home, we we wiped it all down. Yes, um, yes. You know, spray and wipe and so on. Uh, rinsed, rinsed and washed all our vegetables and fruit and all those sorts of things. Um, level three, uh, more businesses were allowed to open, from my understanding. Uh, you were allowed to uh, join your bubbles. So it meant that we could, um, if we had people nearby that uh, we'd like to see, uh, then we could see them. And, and that was usually more about if someone was living alone. Um, so at that point we could have joined the bubble with my mother who lives alone, but she actually joined my sister's bubble. So we didn't need to at that point. Were the stage movements tied to the R naught or or the R zero, or were they tied to other metrics in order to, when the government decided to move from one stage to another? So my understanding is it was probably a little bit more about the new infections, which is related to R zero, but not exactly. Um, so I think it was looking at when if the new infections were tailing off and was that consistent and so then the move to uh, um to level three certainly after two weeks they were sort of having a look to see did we jump back up because a lot of other countries have experienced yeah, that secondary so sort of wave it. yeah um but luckily that didn't happen here and so we sort of kept tailing off and um yeah then we went to level two i think it was about two weeks ago and so in level two you're allowed to move around within your region so we could have gone to the beach again um, and you had the two only, girls teams ready to ready to run. Yeah, had the two girls. Literally. Well, we couldn't do that. And initially, we couldn't do that. So initially, when we went to level two, we were only allowed up to ten. So okay. there was no there was no sports. But then, just um, I think it was uh, last Friday, it went up to a hundred. So now, and these are essentially full contact games. In other words, if the girls have to touch each other while they're going after the ball, that that's all okay. Yeah, they can. So um, so there's there's only training at the moment. So games maybe later in the month or early next month. Uh, we all had to put on, um, everyone had to put hand sanitizer on when they arrived. Um, we had to write everyone's names down for contact tracing. Uh, we sprayed stuff down with disinfectant before and after. So I sort of got all the gear and sprayed it all down. Um, yeah, but absolutely contact. And I sort of at one point was going, should I tell the girls not to hug each other? And I thought, well, they haven't seen each other for ages. And they're going, they're, yeah. So, right. yeah. Judgment calls. Okay, that's, yeah. that's actually, that's actually a really helpful and it's actually quite... Uh, it's uh, inspiring to hear how this worked. And so let's, let's go back to the modeling because now that things are looking good, I'm sure everything is, uh, people are pretty happy with how things are going, but what were some of your initial findings? And I, I'm guessing that at, before the lockdown or before you knew if the shelter in place equivalent stage four was working, I, I, I'm gonna guess that you had some simulations that were a little bit scary. So can you tell me how they looked and uh, how you, in, you, you made a, a, a reference to the interaction between the scientists and the government. And I want to now get back to that. What did you see initially and what did you tell your governmental uh, colleagues? Um, well, I, sh- I should point out that I didn't tell my governmental colleagues anything. That was more the, the other <laughs> TPM members. Um, but yes, certainly the, um, the numbers were very scary. I mean, it was sort of tens of thousands of, of people potentially dying. Um, we were looking at, so New Zealand's ICU capacity at an absolute maximum, this is probably more than we can actually sustain is, is 500 beds. And we were talking about, you know, thousands of people needing ICU care. So What's the population? Forgive me for not knowing. About 5 million. 5 million. So I, 500. I think from models, we assume 5 million. So 500 yeah. ICU beds for 5 million people. And so any kind of tens of thousands of cases would have been un, unmanageable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what right. did what did your TPM colleagues tell the government at that point? Um, so, I, they I don't think they actually told them anything. I, but what they what they did is they ran a bunch of different scenarios of saying, well, if if you do this and if you do this and if we can reduce the transmission to this, this is what it's going to mean. And so I think they ran a bunch of different scenarios to say, here's uh, here's a policy that you could that's worth trying. Or actually, I think probably the government said, what if we do this? And then the, our TPM colleagues would then run the model and say, well, that would result in this. And so um, I think they did just a lot of scenario analysis for them um, using these models. And um, the government decided that the, what they needed to do was lock down really quickly and, and lock down really strongly. 
Um, and I think it was it was pretty. You're completely right. When I looked at the first model, I was like, "This this is actually looking quite scary." Um, and then to see the turnaround relatively quickly of of New Zealand sort of turn it around and start to get back on track. Um, and there was a lot of I think not quite holding our breath, but certainly a lot of watching the numbers to see is is it is this working? You know, and even when we went to level three, I, you know, are we still going down or are we going to, you know, jump back up? Because some of the later models I've done, you, you only need one exposed person in an area and there's still the potential for an outbreak because it's such an infectious disease. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Michael O'Sullivan about the New Zealand uh, COVID modeling effort. And I know that one of the things you, you've made reference to, to it uh, previously is uh, you've actually gone down to modeling a, a geography specific uh, model. And this sounds great. So could you just uh, kind of whet our appetite for what, what are the challenges for doing this much more specific type of modeling? I know the word mesh block comes in. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I know what it is, but it's a very attractive word. So w- what are your current modeling efforts? Yeah, so um, the idea of a mesh block is uh, within New Zealand, there's a small geographic unit called a mesh block, which is the, it's a unit mostly used when they're doing the census. And so it holds, you know, roughly 60 to 120 people. So it's quite a, you know, a couple of blocks if you're talking about in a city. Do they vary in size based on population? They vary in, they vary in size. So in rural areas, they're much bigger. In, in urban areas much smaller um, and so it's more about consistency of population and so and so then what I looked at doing was having an individual continuous time Markov chain for each of the mesh blocks so you sort of assume that people within the mesh block will interact doing somewhat normally yes. and then um, and then we connected the mesh blocks depending on if they shared a closest supermarket or a closest petrol station or a closest doctor so this is really sort of, fine-grained uh, decisions about whether or not they'll be mixing between the mesh blocks. Yeah, yeah, that was the idea. Yeah, and, and so then depending on if, if there was that potential for mixing, uh, then you would change your transmission model so that the, the population in this mesh block could affect the population in this mesh block, for instance. Right. And there was another um, level which was about if they shared a hospital and now that we're going to level two, we're starting to look at commuting data because now people are able to go, go back to work. Um, and so you're really looking at these quite small uh, geographical and population units um, and try to look at the connectedness between them. And so now you can start talking about societal connectedness, um, geographical connectedness and those sorts of things. And that way, um, and that's the model that I've been using uh, to look a little bit at um, a population in South Auckland, which is a bit more vulnerable than other places in the country um, and trying to see, like I said, just one exposed person in that area and you, you, you won't always get an outbreak, but you know, probabilistically some of the time there's, there's a potential for outbreak there. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. More with Michael Sullivan about modeling the outbreak of COVID in New Zealand and in, uh, as we just heard, uh, some um, uh, uh, vulnerable areas of, uh, I think you said Auckland. Um, yes. Uh, next on Sirius XM. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Michael O'Sullivan from the University of Auckland about modeling the COVID epidemic in New Zealand. And in the last bit of discussion, we were talking about these mesh blocks that you're using as now a a key element in your simulations. And I wanted to step back and ask, it seems incredibly fortuitous that the mesh block system exists because you have these nice units. Evidently, you know where the gas stations are and the hospitals and the... why do mesh blocks exist? You said it was used for the, for the census, but um, is that the primary use? And did, did anybody imagine that they would be useful for f- pandemic simulations when they were invented? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I, <laughs> I, I can't imagine so. Um, yeah, so my, my understanding is, and, and to be fair, I'm not an expert on mesh blocks, um, is, is, yeah, so, so they are sort of the, the, the units, I believe that, when a census, uh, when a person is out collecting censuses or, go, or going around, you know, performing the census, then they'll work mesh block by mesh block. Um, and I should say, all the information about petrol stations um, it was actually all um, provided to me by a colleague of mine who's been who'd been involved with the census. And I, I think that part of what's been so inspiring, being part of this process, is the relationship between lots of different people. So. Colleague, research colleagues of mine, uh, people in Statistics New Zealand who have been helping get data for us to do the modelling. Um, and I'm sure with my TPM colleagues, you know, talking to people in government about um, what these models mean for the policy they're setting. 
Um, so I, I think there's been a whole bunch of data that's been used for things that people never would have thought of. Yes. So an example of that is um, cell phone count. So we, we're looking at cell phone counts in different areas and a couple of other colleagues of mine are reverse engineering uh, what movements might be given those cell phone counts. So then we can start seeing how people are moving around between all the different areas. Um, I've got another colleague who's working at it even, he's, he's looking at modeling every single individual in New Zealand and how they connect to one another. So even going more granular than what I'm doing. Um, so that leads to the obvious question about privacy concerns. And so ha, do, what does the public think about this? How have you, um, how have you, if you have tried to get the uh, public trust and having that everybody be on board with these efforts? Because you can imagine a mesh block. Okay, that you, I think you said 60 to 100 people, fine. But when you start doing individuals, I could imagine somebody might get a little bit, uh, a little nervous. And so tell me about the dynamics of that decision and what, what they've done to uh, make it palatable. Yeah, so Statistics New Zealand is, is extremely careful with individual data. So um, I've done other work uh, with um, precious data before and, you know, they, they have all kinds of checks and balances that they put out to make sure that no one's individual data is ever compromised. Mm -hmm. um, so this is that the individual, the individual researchers work with it, but any time there's results published, anything goes public, is um, they check to make sure that no one's um, individual data will be And then you give population averages and things like that it's, so that yeah, the, it yeah, can't be traced yeah. back. Yeah, exactly right. And, and we also work with public data sets. So, for instance, this, the cell phone counts as public data sets. Um, the commute stuff that I was talking about is, is numbers of people commuting between areas. And if that number gets too small, then it, um, they suppress it so you can't see it. So if there's three people moving between you know, two areas, then I have, might have a good chance of understanding who those three people are. So they suppress it so you can't see it. So I think actually one of the things I have been impressed with is, with Statistics New Zealand is how careful they are to make sure individual's data is, is kept safely, despite the fact they have some amazing data sets that we get to work with, just all confidentially with a yes. you know, dedicated safe lab in, in the public service. So, I, yeah. I, but going back to as you can see, I'm obsessed with mesh blocks because I think they're a very powerful idea for for this kind of modeling. And I can, and I assume that then if a mesh block is separated by another from another mesh block by a big mountain, then you might have much less mixing. Uh, and also, if yep. there's a big highway going through, because I, I know from other modeling, basically I know from HIV modeling that in Africa there was this transcontinental highway that was a yeah. major source of the spread of HIV. And it sounds to me like you would be able to capture like whether truckers are stopping at rest stops and transmitting. Um, so tell me, uh, and then you mentioned this vulnerable population. So what can you tell me about some of your most latest modeling? Because somebody could say, well, it sounds like your R naught is 0.5. It's just a matter of time before everything is fine. Um, that I, I, my guess is that is not your attitude. So tell me what the current challenges are and how that's playing out in the modeling questions. Yeah, so I think um, the idea of neighboring mesh blocks is really interesting. And so we had data across mesh blocks that were bordering each other, but also we knew if there was a road going between them. And so that was really important. Although as someone pointed out to me, um, I think somewhere in the east coast of New Zealand, people would quite often get from place to place by horse. So um, then, then, then some, of, some of that road stuff, you know, we had to went out the window a wee bit. Um, so, yeah, we, we were definitely very... Um, there were lots of information about how people move around. And that's where I think things like cell phone data and also transportation data. So road use data is, is yes. super important. Um, and, and exactly what you're talking about, which is, you know, along the major highways is, is really interesting to see. And I think also in New Zealand, uh, you know, the major hubs are probably Auckland and Christchurch for flights. So, you know, if and when our borders reopen, I mean, I think those, you know, those would be key points of consideration. And so what I was talking about in South Auckland is one of the, comorbidities of COVID-19 is diabetes. And, yes. and there's a reasonably large um, contingent of younger people with diabetes in South Auckland. And so for instance, if COVID-19 um, had an outbreak there, which so far it hasn't, um, they would see a much higher presentation of people to a ward and ICU than they would in other areas in the country. Um, and so I suppose the modeling at the moment now is, well, there's two aspects of the modeling I'm doing. Um, one is COVID-19 related, which is saying, if this person turned up here, what would the spread look like? And um, part of that is about informing maybe where you can test to catch it. Mm -hmm. And the other part is actually helping the district health boards who sort of organize the healthcare in various areas, uh, helping them to 
try and um, deal with what's going to happen next. So it might be that COVID-19 is now somewhat under control, uh, but the flu season is sort of, we're right in the middle of it. Although because we've been in lockdown, maybe that's not going to be as bad as it was, but right. there may also be cancer um, patients who have been having to wait for treatment until COVID-19 went away. And so knowing what the, um, the demand at the various different healthcare organisations is going to be like is one of the key um, considerations and in, in where we're doing modelling now to help us kind of get back to quote unquote business as usual. Yeah, I have seen some unpublished data about the um, what what you would call delayed diagnosis and delayed mm. screening for non-COVID diseases. Yeah, and it threatens yeah, yeah. to be a big public health problem because you know the yeah. cancers that have not been detected, the diabetes that has not been detected, uh, these are all going to have long term. So it's a it's a very important um, a very yeah, important that's issue. Right. Yeah, and, and, and what's the effect of those delays have been? And so in some cases, it may not be too much. In other cases, it might be quite serious. And so then someone who's had delayed treatment may, may need much more intervention than they would have otherwise. So um, I want to just end up on a little discussion. You mentioned this very interestingly named uh, uh, institute, the, the TPM. Uh, yeah, and it Tipuna sounds like an, Matatini. Yeah, so can, it's a very intriguing name. So w- where does the name come from? And can you tell me a little bit about the mission of, of this kind of, it sounds like a remarkable organization that kind of mobilized people from all over the uh, academic disciplines? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's a, it's a, so New Zealand has a number of center of research excellence. Um, and Tipuna Matatini is one of those. And these are big groups of researchers that are funded by the government to work on core problems. And um, so t- my understanding, I'd have to, and I have to go back to the website and look it up, is that Tipuna Matatini means the meeting place of many faces. Ah. And so I think one of the key parts of that was to bring people from multiple disciplines to deal with complex systems. Um, so one of that is um, the ecology. So that was sort of looking at, I know there's some of our researchers involved in trying to do uh, predator-free New Zealand. So trying to get rid of predators of our native birds, which is, you know, it, it's incredibly aspirational, but I, I think the, the modeling they're doing is, is certainly going to help in that fight. Um, others is economy and society. And then there's um, where I was involved was just generally complex systems of which I work with healthcare systems a lot. So it really is a group of um, lots of different researchers from lots of walks of life. Um, one of the things I, I really like about it is that kindness is one of the, you know, kind science um, and kindness is one of the key. Um, now, I do not hear that every day. So that's yeah. one of their core principles. It's one of the core principles. And, and I think that's, that's one of the reasons why um, I feel like everyone in TPM is sort of happy to jump and help. So, so it's, it's very collaborative. Um, it, it's really a pleasure to listen to other people and what they're talking about and work with other people. Um, and then we've got some great science communicators. So Sean Hendy, um, who I talked about earlier, is great. Susie Wiles, who's um, a micro, I think a microbiologist, but uh, I might be getting that wrong. But well, she, she's certainly I mean, been... Everybody comes together and you lose track of what their expertise is. Yeah, well, <laughs> she's been doing a lot of science communication about how we can see, keep safe from COVID-19. So we've got some great communicators. We've got, I think, a really nice culture of kindness and togetherness. And, and I think that's part of why the relationship with government has been so good. I, I feel like we're not sort of pushing an agenda. We're sort of trying to do science altogether um, with, you know, kindness kind of is one of the key parts. Of it. Well, thank you so much for delivering to us a story of success with COVID. And of course it's not over yet, but it sounds like you've turned the corner and we're really very grateful. Thank you for listening to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the Sirius XM app.